for the current series of messages here at Home Church Langley based on the eyewitness gospel of John. And what a view, you know, what a view John gives us of this, uh, this Christ. Let me show you. He presents us with a view of the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. He presents us with a view of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John gives us a view of Christ Jesus, who is the light and life of all mankind. He presents us with the view of Christ, the bread of life, who has come down from heaven. He's the one who performed all of these undeniable signs and wonders so that we could and that we would believe that he is exactly who he said he is. And John testified to this. He was absolutely convinced And he spent 50 years, 50 years proclaiming the good news before he died of natural causes. John never got tired of proclaiming this. He never got bored. He never got disillusioned because John said to himself, I saw what I saw and I know that the stories of Jesus are true. John was there. And all of the 11 disciples were convinced as well, even the tragic figure Judas. I believe he was convinced as well. His suicide and his sorrow over betraying Jesus was proof that he also knew who Jesus was. The other 11 disciples spent their entire lives as well, preaching and teaching and evangelizing and planting churches, often in the face of the most violent persecution, and they never stopped. The disciple Jesus was, con- or disciple Peter rather, was convinced that Jesus is who he said he is. And when the Roman soldiers crucified him in 64 A.D., Peter said to them, "Would you do me a favor?" And they said, "What? Would you crucify me upside down? Because I feel unworthy to be crucified and die the same way that my Savior did." And so they did. The disciple James was convinced that Jesus is who he said he is, and he refused to recant his faith. And so King Herod had him executed. So says Acts chapter 12. Now, the interesting thing about that particular situation is tradition tells us that the executioner of James was so moved by James's courage and his passion and his conviction King Herod saw it in the executioner's eyes that this guy was going to convert. So he had him killed as well. And on and on and on it went. Men and women who were absolutely convinced by what they saw with their own eyes in Jesus Christ and who were willing to die for him. Let's review what they saw. First of all, they saw Jesus turn six jars of water into the most beautiful white wine, a clear, crisp Sauvignon invigorating dry with a hint of lime and gooseberry. And no one dared to talk to him about it. Did you know that? There's no discussion. Number two, Jesus healed the cabinet minister's son from a distance of 30 kilometers away. And again, no one dared to talk to him about it. Number three, he restored a 38-year-old man who had been crippled for his entire life at the pool of Bethesda. And this time, this time, someone dared to talk to him about it. And stepping up to the plate were the Jewish religious leaders who challenged him about working on the Sabbath. And Jesus directed that conversation towards his identity, and that's when he made the first group of his staggering claims. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Then the fourth sign was when he fed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two small fish. And this time, it wasn't just a few people that talked to him about it. It was many, many people who talked to him about it. In fact, they chased after him like he was a rock star. They wanted whatever thrills and whatever freebies he could possibly give them, and they peppered him with questions all along the way. These questions Jesus, uh, again, skillfully redirected towards his identity, claiming to be the bread of heaven. And at this point, John tells us that Jesus was on the verge of being drafted as the next king of Israel. It says right after, these are the next words after the uh, miracle of uh, the fish and bread. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's to come into the world. 
Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now this movement to draft Jesus didn't last very long. Because pretty soon, Jesus started talking about... Right about there. Jesus started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and all of a sudden, all those people who were chasing after him decided that instead they would make like a tree and leave. So, Jesus at that point turns to his 12 disciples, and he says, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter answered for them, and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So that's where we're at. Four signs so far. The first major section of John's Gospel is organized around the seven signs that Jesus performed. And then the subsequent conversations that he had with people after performing the signs. But in addition, John throws in a few glorious tangents. And today is one of those glorious tangents a tangent that ties directly into a phrase, a vital phrase, that we encountered last Sunday when Jesus said, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The Holy Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. In John chapter 3, John recounts a certain night early in Jesus' ministry when Jesus spoke about the life-giving Spirit with a very important visitor. John 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. For the most part, Jesus was surrounded by ordinary people. Farmers, fishermen, little kids, widows, and the poor. But here, in this passage, we see him coming into contact with one of the aristocracy of Jerusalem, a man named Nicodemus. And they have this amazing conversation. The verses that we looked at is just the beginning of their conversation. And obviously, it had a huge impact uh, with Nicodemus. Because later on, when Jesus' crucified body is taken down from the cross... John tells us it was this man, Nicodemus, who provided 75 pounds of myrrh and spices to embalm Jesus' body. Clearly, this conversation had an impact on Nicodemus. In due time, this man, who is completely befuddled and confused by Jesus' words, believed. But who was he? Who was this Nicodemus? Well, he was one of the 6,000 Pharisees of Israel. Now, when I say the word Pharisee, we immediately have this negative connotation. We take a dim view of Pharisees these days. We equate Pharisees equals hypocrites, right? That's what we always go. Pharisees equal hypocrites. But back in the day, Pharisees were considered the top dogs of Israel. They were an exalted brotherhood, the highest caliber of Jewish people. Now, why was there such a high view of Pharisees? Well, it's because they made a vow to spend their entire lives observing every single detail in the law and in all of the applications of the law. To the devout Jew, the law was the most sacred thing in the entire world. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And it is sacred. It always will be sacred. 
They believed the law to be the perfect word of God. It contained everything a man ever needed to know for living a good life. But then somewhere along the way, around 600 B.C. or 500 B.C., the Jews took a strange detour. And let me tell you what it was. They said, yes, the law is complete. Yes, the law contains everything necessary for living a good life. And therefore, the law must be able to govern every possible incident in every possible moment for every possible human being. They didn't trust the Holy Spirit to make the applications. They decided they needed to cover all the possible applications themselves. And so they got busy. They got busy extracting all from the great principles of the law an infinite number of rules and regulations to govern every conceivable situation in life. Turning the law into this massive, complicated compendium of bylaws, rules, and situations, the resulting document of all of that work is this. The Talmud. 6,200 pages of applications of the five books of the law. So, the job of extracting regulations and defining rules and providing examples was the job of the scribes. They worked out all the regulations. So guess what the job was of the Pharisees? It was to give it the old college try to keep it all, to do it. And they dedicated their lives to keeping everything written in the Talmud. And that's why Pharisees were viewed as the top dogs of Israel. The word Pharisee itself is defined as separated one. They were just different than the regular Jew, and they were viewed differently. They were in a league of their own. They weren't amateur Jews. They were professional grade. Professional grade. And so Nicodemus was one of these 6,000. But in addition... He was also a member of the ruling council. That was an elite group of 70 called the Sanhedrin. And you know what the Sanhedrin did later on. They were the ones that condemned Jesus. The Sanhedrin was like the Supreme Court. They had the final say in everything. They held religious jurisdiction over every Jew in the world. Now, I'm going into great detail about Nicodemus, but there's a reason I'm belaboring this point that he was a highly accomplished, studiously righteous, extremely holy man. My point is that despite being so good, so powerful, so honorable, Nicodemus knew in here. Nicodemus knew in here that there was something lacking in his life. Just like me. Just like you Just like every person on this earth, there is a void inside of our lives that only Jesus Christ can fill. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the dark of the night, hoping to find some light. And they have this extraordinary conversation. John must have been up late that night to listen in. And it starts like this. Rabbi... We know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God was not with him. Now, I don't know what you think about signs and wonders, but Nicodemus was mighty impressed by signs and wonders. In fact, you might say he was a little fixated on signs and wonders that Jesus did. But in Jesus' response, he didn't even go there. He didn't even enter into a discussion about signs and wonders. Why? It's because he wanted Nicodemus to consider the greatest sign and wonder of all. Pastor, what is the greatest sign and wonder of all? Well, that's when there is the spiritual regeneration of a lost, disobedient, rebellious soul into someone who embraces Jesus Christ with all of their heart as their Savior and Lord. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And as you know, Nicodemus initially misunderstands. But we need to understand why he misunderstood. This Greek word 
again is anothen. And it's one of these words like in English language, like the word run. The word run can mean all kinds of different things. And anothen could mean at least three different things. It could mean from the beginning. You must be born from the beginning. That is, you must be born all over again. From the start. Completely. All together. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, you must be born anothen. Or it could be, again, for the second time. Back up the truck, rewind the tape, let's do it again. Or it could mean from above. You must be born from a place up there. You must be born of God's own impetus, God's own decision. You must be born of heaven. And you know, for those of you who are familiar with various translations of the Bible, you've seen these translations occur. So what's the correct definition? Honestly, I think it's D, all the above. I think it's D. To be born anothen is this. All I did is I took the three definitions and I blended them into one. Here it is. To be born again is to undergo such a complete and total change, meaning number one, that it's like backing up the truck, rewinding the tape, and doing life over again, meaning number two, because something so astonishing has happened to your soul, something that God alone can take credit for, because it originated with Him, meaning number three. Does that paragraph describe you? It seems that Nicodemus was caught off guard. He assumed Jesus meant meaning number two. He says, how could someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. But, you know, was Nicodemus really that dumb? Do you think he was really that dumb? I don't think so. I want us to keep in mind that here sat in front of Jesus a very intelligent, outwardly successful man at the top of his field who is nevertheless frustrated with his life. Sensing there's a void, sensing there's something missing in him. And it got to the point where he was willing to do something crazy, put on a fake mustache, glasses, sneak out in the middle of the night to speak to an itinerant carpenter from Nazareth who performed miracles in his spare time. So perhaps their conversation included something like this. Jesus, you talk about being born again. You talk about this radical, this fundamental, this complete change which is so necessary, which I know is necessary, to be honest, which I feel is necessary. But in my experience, Rabbi, it's impossible. You might as well tell me, a full-grown man, to enter my mother's womb and be born all over again. Because that's how impossible change seems to be. That's how impossible change seems to be. So like Nicodemus, we're all up against this age-old problem, this eternal conundrum of same old, same old. We want to change, and yet we can't change ourselves. We want to be better people, and we just can't seem to change ourselves. We want to love our wives as we should, and we can't change ourselves. We want to stop cursing and cruising and thinking evil thoughts, and we can't change ourselves. We want to be clean and sober and finally grow up and can't change ourselves. We want to stop having all these disasters befall us and can't change ourselves. In our experience, it's just impossible. You might as well tell us to crawl back inside our mother's womb. Born again, with all due respect, Jesus, whatever, whatever do you mean? Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So the question is, how do we change? In our own strength, we're not capable of it. Last week, Jesus told us that it's the Spirit that gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. 
Have we overemphasized self-help books? I think so. Have we overemphasized New Year's resolutions? I think so. Have we frustrated ourselves by trying constantly to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps? I think so. Jesus says we need something from God. Something from God to enter into us, to take possession of us, to change us so that we can obey Him as we ought. What does it mean to be born again? Five things. First of all, to be born again is to experience the supernatural within you. I've already mentioned that Nicodemus had heard about and probably witnessed with his own two eyes signs and wonders that Jesus performed. Maybe he was... Maybe you heard about the water being turned into wine. Maybe he was there when there was the long-distance healing. Maybe he was there in Bethesda and he saw that man healed. Maybe he was watching the crowd being fed by fish and bread. Those signs and wonders were the very thing that Nicodemus needed, providing him with the reason to seek out Jesus in the first place. But again, as I mentioned, Jesus ignores the signs and wonders out there. And he points to the signs and wonders in here. For to be born again is to experience something supernatural inside yourself which is greater than the coolest miracle ever performed on the face of the earth. Signs and wonders don't save. Signs and wonders don't save a human soul. Only Jesus saves. So to be born again is to experience the supernatural within you. Secondly, to be born again is new life, not new religion. Nicodemus had plenty of religion. Thank you very much. As a Pharisee, he had spent his entire life trying to be obedient, to follow the law, to be good. But how did he end up? He ended up frustrated and unhappy and hungry for what Jesus had in abundance. What did Jesus have in abundance? He had life. He had spiritual life. He had life from God. He had this godly life in him that Nicodemus knew nothing about. All Nicodemus could boast about was the religion of doing the do's and resisting the don'ts. And that's what all religion is like. Religion is all about do's and don'ts. But believing Jesus is different. It's a one of a kind non religion. I never even put believing Jesus, I never put faith in Christ in the same category as religions of the world. It's a non religion because believing in Jesus is all about the word done, not do's and don'ts, but about done. It's done on the cross, it's done by his blood, it's done by the life giving spirit, it's done by the drawing and the enabling of the Father we looked at last week. And again, you have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. That's a threefold cord, and it cannot be broken. It is not religion, it's relationship, it's new life. Thirdly, to be born again is receiving the life of Jesus within you. To be born again is to be changed completely, backing up the truck, rewinding the tape, starting over by a power source that is not your own, but a power source that comes from above. It's rebirth, it's recreation, and it starts when we believe that Jesus is who he said he is, and we fall in love with him, who is the Lamb of God, the light and the life of all mankind, past, present, and future. We fall in love with him who is the word, the governing principle who became flesh, dwelling among us and then dying for us. It is not hard to fall in love with someone like that. It is not hard to fall in love with Jesus. Believe in him. Fall in love with him. Invite him into your heart. This is how we change. Not only that, this is how we become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. This is how we become children of God. This is how we enter into this new thing called eternal life. This is how we're born again. 
Every man, woman, boy, or girl is incomplete, is unfulfilled, is lacking without possessing the life of Jesus within them. Number four, to be born again is to be born of water and the Spirit. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Water is the symbol of cleansing. When you believe in Jesus and you fall in love with him and you invite him into your heart, he enters into your house. And the first thing he does is clean that house. Forgiving all of your past sins, taking out the garbage, cleaning the graffiti off the walls, mopping the floors, and laundering out the stains. This is the cleansing work of Jesus. This is what it means to be born of water. The Spirit is the symbol of power. When Jesus enters in and takes possession of our lives, not only is the past forgiven and forgotten, but a new power enters in, enabling us to be what we cannot be in ourselves, enabling us to do what we could never do in our own strength. So we have water that cleanses, the Spirit that strengthens. One wipes out the past, the other gives new strength and victory in the future. It's very important to understand both sides. We are born of water and of the Spirit. And fifthly, to be born again is new life through the Holy Spirit. The principle that Jesus highlights is that flesh gives birth to flesh. It's all it can do. But the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You and I, on our own, are flesh. We're limited to what the flesh can do. What can the flesh do? The flesh can do self-improvement. The flesh can read self-help books. The flesh can try, 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 and try harder next time. The flesh can work, and it's very frustrating. But to be born again of the water and of the Spirit is different it in, because it involves the work of God. It's way above physical life and physical trying. It's way above physical hearts. It's way above what our physical brain can do. It's way above physical abilities and energies. To use the words of the Westminster Catechism, to be born again is the work of God's Spirit whereby convincing us of our sin and our misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, he persuades and enables us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. This is what it means to be born again. It is not self-improvement. It is not religion. Nor is it an American fad of the 1980s. It is new creation. It is new beginning. It's a completely new start. And most importantly of all, it is from God, the Holy Spirit, who gives us new spiritual life in here, the supernatural in here, connecting us with Jesus Christ through faith, through believing Jesus is who he said he is. As a result, your sins are cleansed. Your hard heart becomes soft. As a result, your opinion about Jesus changes from don't know, don't care, to he is the most important treasure in my life. And it starts with faith. So I invite you now, in the name of Jesus, by the power of his spirit to receive him. Right where you are, as the sin-forgiving, transforming treasure of your life. My question is simple. Will you receive him? Would you like to be born again, completely starting over by the power of God? If you will stand... I will pray.
to be born again. You addressed the emptiness in his life. And here we are. Standing before you, responding to you, each one with a desire to start over again by the power of God, to be born from above. Lord, we have felt your spirit stirring in our hearts, some for a long time, some more recently. But Lord, to be born again, to start over, to be made new from head to toe, to be born of the power of God is what we want. Lord, I pray now that everyone who is standing, everyone who is responding to you would be born of water and the Spirit at this very moment that all sins of the past would be forgiven, would be lifted off of them like a heavy burden, and that there would be freedom. That they would be born of the Spirit, no more just trying and doing do's and resisting the don'ts, but having their will transformed, enlightening our minds, renewing our desires, wanting to obey you, and from this moment on, embracing you, Lord Jesus, as the most important treasure in our entire life. We choose this day to serve you, to follow you, Lord Jesus, because we believe that you are who you said you are, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away my sins. You are the light and the life of all mankind, and everyone who believes in you will no longer walk in darkness. This is who you are. We put our trust and our faith in you, Lord Jesus. We will follow you, and from this day on, we will think of ourselves as men and women who are born again. In Jesus' name, amen.